Welcome to Synced On Air. I'm your host, Angelique Robb, and our podcast is brought to you by Turf Sup Radio, your station, your music. Today I have Mike Watts, and I'm really excited to introduce him to our audience and our network of um of members, Mike has started with Synced as a business development manager. And today you're gonna to get to meet him and learn how he got into the industry and how he ended up with us. So Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, Angelique, thrilled to be here. Thanks for doing this. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll start off by uh, telling myself, uh, telling you all about myself. So my name is Mike Watts. I grew up in the Northeast about an hour outside of New York City. My passions were music and theater growing up, and I did a lot of performing up until high school. And at age 14, I taught myself how to play guitar. And by the time I was 16, I started a band with my brother and my best friend. And, you know, at first, oh, it, cool. <laughs> at first it was nothing too crazy. We recorded an album, uh, played around locally. Uh, however, for the second album we recorded a year later, it uh, picked up in the scene very quickly and then we gained quite a lot of notoriety and continued to play bigger and bigger venues uh fast forward a couple years later we were supporting huge acts like fallout boy paramore bowling for soup and during this time i was supplementing my income through uh working at various landscaping companies and learning the trade and i've always had a fascination with nature so it was a really great job to have on the side and as years went on, we continued to perform and record, but it was getting a bit more difficult to make a living off of it, which is you know, this when I started to dive more into the business of landscaping. And let's see, in 2015, I moved from the Northeast Jersey to New York City to live with my girlfriend. And shout out to Annie, she's great. Uh, she'd been living there for a few years. Uh, you know, and the prospect of moving to the city was a bit daunting for me as I had no idea how to utilize that trade in a city environment. However, I quickly found a job at a company called Trillium Landscape Design, which uh, Trillium is a high-end landscaping company which services mostly residential brownstones, penthouses, patios, uh, rooftops, corporate offices, pretty much mostly residential. And it's I was gonna a say very different from your traditional maybe landscape company <laughs> yeah very different i you know up until then i'd been working in the suburbs and to make that shift was a pretty large one but um you know it's it's a great company in which i learned a great deal from the team there uh, especially the owner dan hunter um you know whenever i talked about my work there people would often wonder how it's even possible they're like how what are you doing? like landscaping in new york this doesn't make sense uh but then you know i would explain what we did and we had a very strong emphasis on detail. Everything we did was highly mm. detail oriented, which was great, uh, very different, but it really allowed me to hone my horticultural practices and learn the finer skills of the trade and selective pruning and everything in that nature. I mean, give the audience a bit of a glimpse into those kind of projects, because again, I think we'll still have a lot of people going, how did he do, you know, landscaping in New York City? So what, so, describe some of the jobs. So some of the jobs, you know, a, a lot of them were rooftop, rooftops and terraces, uh, okay. you know, create privacy hedges. We would, we would do seasonal uh, installations as well. So spring, we'd, we'd bring in the violas and the pansies and all that. And essentially what our clients wanted was an oasis in you know they worked in offices and a corporate life and then they come home they just wanted to disconnect and have an oasis so we would create those oasis for people and it would every season we would transplant rip it all out unfortunately you know we would lose a lot of material but it was just it was really thrilling to be able to constantly change the landscape change the visuals of everything and really just work with the aesthetics that we had to offer. We would, obviously we would bring new containers if they needed it, um, work on the irrigation, a lot of irrigation projects up there, and which is a lot different from suburban irrigation. You know, you have to use a lot of spaghetti wires and things of that nature. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. What we really focused on was 
really meticulously pruning and fertilizing and just making sure that these plants were not going to die on our hands. Yeah, yeah. but the, the, a whole different type of landscaping, like you said. Um, yeah, I guess even water use. I mean, yeah, do you, do you um, recycle a lot of the water when you're doing a rooftop terrace? Uh, not really. Um, there were a lot of a lot of buildings in New York City have water towers, and you know, so we had, did have a bit of pressure issue with some of the buildings because you know they were in the early 1900s and are still kind of using old systems. Not all of them, but some of them. So that was uh, an interesting challenge, having to get pressure boosters on a lot of our irrigation and spigots. Um, but yeah, it it was it was certainly a unique challenge. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. And where, where did you go from here? So, um, yeah. So I was, I was at Trillium for about nine years. And at first I started in the fields. The last two and a half years working there, I was doing operations management. So everything from scheduling to client management, mm -hmm. client relations, and a bit of HR work and a lot of admin work, uh, which was great. I really enjoyed I, I miss the field every now and then, but you know, I was making runs to uh, nursery, uh, going to nurseries out in Long Island, because uh, that's where we picked up all our materials from. And that was obviously a day trip. <laughs> the city traffic was a nightmare. So that was always fun. Um, but I did miss the field, but I really enjoyed the bigger picture and kind of the strategy behind it and, and dealing with the clients. I really enjoy fulfilling the clients and, and keeping them happy. That was always something I really thrived in and personally loved. Um, mm -hmm. So then let's see, that was, I left at the end of 2023. Then I started, and then I, my wife and I, we've been planning to move to North Carolina for a couple of years before that and we've been saving up. And eventually we finally were able to pull the trigger, bought a house down by the coast uh, in the Outer Banks. I don't know if anybody here knows about that. We've been in the news lately with houses falling into the water. Yes, I've seen that. I know, and I've th thought of you every time. <laughs> yeah, Why and there's the actually outer... a hurricane coming through right now. It's going... Yeah, there's a hurricane coming through now. Helene, who's uh, luckily going farther west from us, so we're, we'll be all right. But um, to answer your question, what, what brought us there? Honestly, I just, I've been going there my whole life. For vacation with my family and it always just felt like home to me it was always our second home really and like i said earlier i just love nature i love being by the water i love getting my hands dirty and that place is rugged and perfect for that so it always drew me in my wife and i we got married there five years ago she had actually agreed to do that before even seeing the place she just was like all right a beach count me in <laughs> <laughs> and uh say no more and she fell in love with the place and we spent the past few years saving up and then we bought the house and moved down there and it's been excellent so far we wow, uh that's a big change from new york though it is a very big change i mean everybody who we meet down there is flabbergasted though they're like why, why would you leave new york what brought you here and you know it's the heart wants what it wants is the best answer you know we we had a a good thing in New York. We we really enjoyed it, but we just knew we wanted something different, a little bit uh, slower pace to raise children. Eventually, that was always kind of a driving force. But you know, we just we wanted to be beach bums out on the on the water. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nature and, uh, is soothing, and yeah, it is. Um, it's good to be in nature. You know, it really is. Um, yeah. Luckily, where we are, we're very fortunate. Our house is right in the harbor. So we, in our front yard, is looking out at the body of water, the sounds. And then behind us, we have a, a canal, a little inlet with a dock, a boat lift, which with no boat yet, but that's <laughs> on its way. I figure that out. <laughs> it's really beautiful to look out and gorgeous sunsets every night and be on the water. We've got some kayaks. We got a whole fleet of kayaks that we take out with our friends, and yeah, it's pretty magical. Sounds like life changing. It really is. Yeah, 
and I'm back in New York at the moment, actually. So it, it's been a bit bizarre. You know, this is the first time I've been here in a year. And the first night I was here, my my wife was like, you know, your eyes are wide open. You're you're really wide eyed right now. And it it is very strange to go from such a quiet, remote place to the big city. But, you know, it's it was like riding a bike, though. The rhythm just came right back. And the next day it just felt like normal. Do you miss the big city at all? There are things that I miss. Um, the ability to get any cuisine delivered to you within 20 minutes is, <laughs> you know, that's a parallel. So you leave New York City, you lose that, right? But I I do miss that. I miss seeing a lot, I have a lot of friends up here. I grew up around here, so I do miss them. But luckily, you know, they've come and visit. Um, but to be honest, uh, the pros outweigh, outweigh the cons for us. Um, you know, I said to my wife earlier this week that when we lived in New York, we would vacation in the Outer Banks. We try to get down there as much as possible. But now we've just swapped it. Now we live there and we'll try to get here to visit. You know, we just prefer them. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, and and what's the next phase of the story? <laughs> <laughs> so I started working for a landscaping company called Living Oaks Landscaping in uh, Kill Devil Hills. Yeah, well, they're in Palace Point, but the whole area is kind of small, so details don't really matter. Um, but yeah, I worked there for about nine months. It was a good group of people. Uh, I was back in the field, which I enjoyed, but I realized within being there for a few months that I wanted to do more bigger picture work like I was doing with Trillium in the operations management. And I really like the oversight. I, I like dealing with clients, and I wasn't going to get that there. And then some woman on LinkedIn called Angelique Robb connects with me <laughs> and, you know, have a couple discussions. And next thing you know, I'm working for Sinks and it's <laughs> wonderful. Uh, no, really, though, it's it's the it, the timing was pretty kismet. You know, I, I was feeling like I needed to give back in a really or not give back, really fulfill what I wanted, which was to work in landscaping, but not quite in the traditional way that I had been for most of my career. And this was a perfect outlet to do it. And, and I absolutely love working with you so far. It's been exciting. It's a totally new landscape for me, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> I never thought I'd be working for a publication, but I am thrilled to be involved with it and seeing your vision. And I wanna help, help us get there. Awesome. Well, um, it's only been, uh, you know, a couple of weeks, so <laughs> mm -hmm. <Very new. laughs> hopefully, um, hopefully, you know, keep that enthusiasm, but yes, of course. Um, well, I think what's, what's interesting about your story is that, um, you've seen, you know, maybe the, the typical landscaping company, you know, in North Carolina. And then you've seen this high end, very niche, you know, very specific, um, you know, clientele and, and maybe very demanding clientele, I would, I would imagine. Really um, and, and I think that, um, you know, how, how, our industry can differentiate themselves um, and and grow to be something greater than a small landscape company is that diff that detail that yeah. um, customer service. I mean, I've heard some business owners say we're not in the landscape business; we're in the people business, and this is you know after they've grown to revenues of 10 to 20 million dollars and i think that you know the the company owners that that get that you know relationship importance um have really you know they focused on customer service yes totally and that was the main differentiator that i noticed with trillium you know we and it became my job to to do it which was we we had so many custom packages we had it, it was really our services were totally tailored to the customer and we were fortunate enough to be in a place to do that you know there were some people 
would just give you a blank check and say, you know, just give me what I just like white, put white in there. Or other people would really be a little bit more involved and and want to have their say a little bit more, which was great. We liked all of it. We enjoyed working with everybody. And it, to your point, it, it really was a tailored process. And that kind of level of detail and customer service retains customers better than anything that I've seen before. Um, you know, there are people, you know, what I noticed happening in the other banks that there are people, there's a lot of renter rental houses out there too. So it's people aren't necessarily involved with it. They just want it to look good enough to rent uh, sort mm. of mobile routines, which I understand that needs to get done and there's value there. But personally, I enjoy one interacting with the people and providing service and a pleasant one. Uh, but also the detail work is something I just personally love. It, it, it allows you to absorb the horticulture of it. You know, it's, I felt more like a landscaper in North Carolina, but I felt more like a horticulturalist in New York and really understanding and learning how the plants evolve and, and grow and making little tweaks with selective pruning and how much the small changes can just elevate the whole landscape and the aesthetic of the space. That's the kind of stuff that I really dove into and love and are the kind of things that I would love to keep highlighting with Synced. Well, and at, so at Trillium, um, did you also do installation work, um, you know, design, install, and maintenance? I mean, you're talking about pruning and... Or, yeah. yeah, we did the installations, which were seasonal, you know, every okay. spring or fall, winter, we would switch it all out. And especially winter, you know, a lot of people don't, a lot of companies don't do much in winter. And we yeah. we made a lot of good money in winter because we would use pines, balsam, winter berries and really beautify the the tree guards and people's terraces whatever we had in the planters up on the rooftops for example we would then fill up with tons of balsam tons of pine it would smell like christmas it was beautiful um we didn't do much build work like uh, landscape construction that was always stuff okay. we subcontracted out we were involved okay. with the because we were the the go-to like, the clients really just wanted one company to oversee it all which we did that but okay. we weren't doing that work that was always yeah surprising. yeah but still by project managing it i would say you're still doing it you know you're still oh, the yeah. point of contact you're still directing um the one thing i keep thinking of is you know are you going up in elevators to all these places and and the logistics yes. must be um first off costly and and hard to estimate the time that it's going to take to do a normal job you betcha yeah there's one job that sticks out to me right right away which was um it was on the upper east side and we were bringing a bunch of bamboo which wasn't my you know nobody in trillium was really thrilled about the idea of putting bamboo up there with how invasive it is and we've seen a couple rooftops have issues with the roots going into the foundation and Yikes. it's a problem but they were adamant about it and they were they were going to pay for it so we put our word in and they still wanted it but you know throughout so it was a lovely penthouse at the rooftop and we had to bring let's see they were about eight foot tall maybe eight to ten feet tall oh and we had to get them through the elevator one to, or about five at a time and they they were there were 70 of them that were bringing up there <laughs> and we then had to wrap them up so because we were going through their stairs once we got up into the penthouse we had to go up two spiral staircases with them so, so not spiral at that oh my goodness not only was it difficult getting it into the building at all getting it through that house without damage we had to pad up the entire walls wrap it all up wrap all the bamboo up and it was just it was a serious challenge, but we, we did it with no problems. We actually ended up using a little bit less, but um, yeah, there are unique challenges with almost every single job because you never know. Some of these buildings are, like I said earlier, from the early 1900s. They didn't really plan for uh, high-end landscaping to come in and <laughs> re renovate the whole rooftop, right? But we, we met it with a smile on our face every time and enjoyed it every day. 
Well, and I can imagine, I mean, you mentioned earlier that, you know, budget usually wasn't an issue, but I can imagine it's, you know, you still have to, um, you still have to estimate correctly. I mean, you can't, no matter what the budget is, you can't be off by 50%, you know, on logistics. So how did you, I mean, maybe that had they kind of figured that out by the time you started or were you figuring that out? I mean, how do you, how do you accurately estimate these things? <laughs> yeah. Um, we would, um, I wasn't directly in charge of the estimates per se, okay. but we there a lot of the estimates we had done were based off of the previous uh, year, and because a lot of it was you know repeat. Okay. So we had the system pre unlock. However, for jobs like that with the bamboo, that was a one off job. So, um, like I said, I think we overshot it a little bit just for space, but you know we yeah yeah we. 90 i would say 90 percent of the work we did was pretty routine and had been we've okay you know the yeah. ballpark what it's going to be yeah uh, but it, you know those other ones i guess because we had so much consistency with the other installs we were able to have a little more flexibility with the stranger more unique jobs it's well little... i guess that that does really help if you've been there before and you're going regularly. Um, yeah, that does make a difference. I can imagine the first job though would have been <laughs> very yeah. tough to estimate. <laughs> for sure. You know, it's and they're pretty wildly different too. Like the tree guards, for example, you know, there's only, a, it's a small little space. So, you know, you, there's only so long it could really take depending on how many uh, tree guards there are. But once you're dealing with the in, the insides, like the rooftops and the terraces, then it's really getting tricky because we were also meticulous about not getting any debris anywhere. So with booties on, put all pretty much every bit of plant material in, in bags to make sure that nothing is going into these homes, especially when it's a little rainy. It was very challenging. Oh my goodness. Yeah. We would off, you know, if it was too rainy, we obviously wouldn't, we would call the day, but a little drizzle here and there still can complicate it and we'll try to get it done still and we ran into some challenges but again we well, always ready for it and i guess um like so um personally we've had a we have a in scotland um we installed a green roof on our property and and so that really brought home um to me on, on a rooftop you know the paying attention to the weight of the soil, you know, mm -hmm. what kind of soil you use and, and also that, you know, you're holding water, um, you know, all, all the weights on rooftops, that's really critical too. Did you use, um, specialty soils, um, anything like that, or did you have to take in, I mean, maybe because it was repeat business, you know, it was already calculated and all that. Um, but I guess I was just wondering if you know about. Um... Yeah, we we had mostly uh, we what we would use for pretty much planting was a bit of compost and metro mix. Um, so we had a pretty good. S I mean, a lot. Some of the buildings that we would do. Let's see. There was a succulent living terrace that we made, uh, which was really unique and cool. But all of that, the weight issues, and for example, were handled through the building. Like that had been there prior okay. to us. Some of it had been. We planted all the succulents and the material, but the soil and the um, general layout had already been done. Okay. Normally, stuff is done through the buildings because they they're very tight ship in New York City. They, everything has to be up to code. You know, there's there's nothing falling through the cracks like that. So okay. Fortunately, we didn't really have much uh of a, a responsible well we obviously had responsibility but the safety had already usually been taken care of before we okay. were there awesome awesome well very interesting to yeah to think about only doing rooftops and balconies and little yeah. parcels of of uh you know projects here and there so um what a contrast well and and i think that um you know what's neat is because you've seen such a a huge um contrast in types of companies i think that that you know gives you a whole nother perspective on the industry too um 
I mean, just the yeah. conversations that you and I've had to date, you know, it's, it's about, um, you know, seeing the gaps in the industry and, and where we can help. Um, and, you know, what you said earlier, I really found was interesting that you've kind of, you know, the nine years, I guess, so 10 years in the industry, you've um, found the parts of the industry that you like. Um, what what excites you about working for Saint? Um, and and what, what kind of difference do you want to make in the industry? I'm really excited to learn more about other landscaping companies, honestly. You know, I, I've worked for a couple in New Jersey uh, and then Trillium and then in North Carolina, but I'd love to I like the people. I like working with people and finding a new companies to highlight the work that they're doing is something that really excites me. I think there's so much amazing work that's getting done in the country and there's not a lot of people really advertising or talking about it. And even the companies mm -hmm. themselves, you know, they, they do the job and then you usually move on. You're so busy. You got to move on to the next one. And it's hard to really advertise and highlight what you've done. And especially the unique one like, there's so many unique projects throughout sinks it sinks issues and i just want to keep finding more of those you know people doing innovative work and groundbreaking work and like we say raise the bar and i think that that's my main motivator to work with you is i want to be a part of raising that bar i think there needs to be more of a community that we can foster and grow together and learn from each other while, we, while we're not necessarily all competing with each other, we can certainly help each other out. And I think that that's where I really want to focus on. Well, and I think, you know, I think you're right. We, we have such an awesome industry and we don't ha often have time to stop and celebrate unless you've yeah. gotten to that bigger size and you have more resources and, um, you know, just the statistics that, you know, a huge portion of our industry is one to four employees. And, you know, I, I think it's over 70% is one to four employees. And, you know, that's, that's probably a, a tough time to, you know, you're figuring out how to grow and scale, you're figuring out your overheads. Um, it's, it's a hard road. Um, and so, yeah, I think that by celebrating the success of, of businesses who have gotten to a, a good place and who have figured out what works for them and sharing that, it's going to be different for every company. But um, the more of these great stories that we can share, the more success we can hopefully have as a as a whole and help companies have more successes. So um, that's Absolutely. what we're step by I'd love, step i'd love to be a part of you know we highlight a company that's done an amazing rooftop for example and a new system or a new area type of irrigation system whatever it may be and that another company reads that and then they start implementing that that's where i think our success really lies and that's that's how you raise the bar is just bring more awareness to the work that people are doing even quite under the radar you know and what do you think about, because um, I have my own thoughts, but what do you think when we say we, we need, you know, we need more and more people all the time, like we have a huge labor shortage. What, what, what's your take on that comment? Well, I've definitely worked for some companies that have had trouble not only retaining company employees, but finding the work. You know, it, I think it's an industry that, there is there can be a stigma towards um i've felt it personally you know like people a long especially a long time ago when i was a little younger and kind of starting out in my career there they'd wonder why are you getting into that why you can't make tons of money doing that you don't want to work on on fine right. like wall street you don't want to do that and i think there's just i think that attitude doesn't help um mm -hmm might be a little discouraging to people to get into the industry which hopefully what we're doing can reach those people and say hey look there is money to be made here there's creative work that you can do i think that's also an element that is not really highlighted that 
creative people might not see a future in this industry, but mm. so it is creativity, you know, it, it obviously, is. obviously there's backbreaking work and a lot of sweat and, and all that, but the, the core of it is really being creative and allowing yourself to experiment if, if you're fortunate enough to be able to. And yeah, I think, I think that's probably what leads to the a, a variable to the labor shortage is just the stigma and attitude towards it. And I hope we can change that. Yeah. It's probably, probably a long journey to do that, but you know, we can do well, it. The long game is, is the right game, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. So you can't change everybody's minds instantly, but um, again, it, it's such a rewarding um, industry and uh, yeah, you're right. We, there's still a stigma. Um, we've had multiple business owners say that in interviews that there still is a, a stigma. Um, one that comes to mind is a good friend of mine, Joe Langton, and he runs a, a company in Chicago and he said he belongs to a, uh, um, like a country club kind of place. And when he tells people he's a landscaper, they're like, what, you know? And even that, yeah. that the word doesn't even illustrate what we do. Um, you know, I, I, I almost think that we could use a better word for our industry because it's almost, um, it's been overused and it's misunderstood. And I say I'm a landscaper. Um, and, you know, since we've moved back to the States, I would say that to new friends and and they don't know my company from from Scotland and they go, oh, OK. Um, and then somebody also asked me, what do you mean by landscaping? And then I would say, well, we design and construct outdoor spaces with walls, patios and plant them up. And and then the friend that thought that we just cut grass and and I'm not trying to belittle cutting grass because that's a that's a huge business too and a very professional business but um it's just the misunderstanding of that word um yeah it goes a long way to confusing people about our industry <laughs> it, sure, it sure does like I I know when I would meet people and tell people what I was doing when I was especially when I was in New York I would so like I work in horticulture, I wouldn't necessarily say I work in landscaping because people have this vision of landscaping. Oh, you're you're a 12 year old with a lawnmower just going around and cutting grass and blowing it. And then that's it. And, and it's, you know, while that is a very small part of what the landscaping industry has to offer, it's so far from what the the real potential is and, and mm -hmm. the big picture of it all. So it's definitely an issue that we need to correct. Well, and speaking of those 12 year olds mowing grass, um, there are quite a few of those that are now running multi million dollar companies. Yeah. And, um, and yeah. they will be, we all have a, a cohort of those um, under 30 business owners that are multi million dollar business owners now um, at our Sync Live event in 2025 in Atlanta. So, um, yeah, it's it's not just a uh, you know twelve year olds running you know, but but I think it's a, it's really cool to see how um, you know some of these companies started just like yeah. you're saying and think, have grown think, into something more. Yeah, it's it's really amazing to see the development that those kind of people and companies have gone through, and I can't wait to learn more about them at, at our event and pick up your tickets if you haven't got them, everybody. It's gonna be. <laughs> Be a good one. Great, great plug. And um, I think this has been a great introduction to your background. And, you know, we have a true rock star on our team now. So oh. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I very much well, appreciate it. <laughs> we're excited to have you. And um, yeah, look forward to, um, we're actually meeting in person at HNA and Equip coming mm -hmm. up soon. So if um, if anybody's there and want to reach out, please, you know, we'll be walking around. Please uh, reach out to us and we look forward to meeting you there. Yeah, awesome. please do. 
I'm also equally as thrilled to be here. I can't wait to show everyone what we got and help these companies grow. Awesome. Well, we'll have you on our future podcast too, helping me do the interviews. So looking forward to that. And um, thanks for being on the show, Mike. Welcome to the team. Thank you. Appreciate it.